Welcome everyone. Simulation Pulse Live, episode number, I'm not sure, like nine, <laughs> <laughs> nine something or like so. That, I think. Yeah, something, something like that. that. Yeah. Been at it for a little while. I was looking back at the YouTube channel for what it's worth. If anybody's watching the recording, you can go to a catechist's uh YouTube channel. Let me get a link to it here so we can share and see all of the past episodes of the pulse live well in fact it's right here on the pulse page awesome. so i will post to everyone hi rick hey rick um hey bill rick castile is here well we are still in vr pediatric simulation month and next week on uh, april 19th at noon central we're going to have a great panel discussion um, we've got, let me pull up my notes here. Should have this stuff prepared ahead of time. But we've got Dr. Jeffrey Jacobson joining from Boston Children's Hospital, who is the XR lead of immersive design systems there. Um, we've got Dr. McAdams, uh, who you might remember from the recent video that we had shown a few weeks back. He's the neonatology division chief and division of global pediatrics and department of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Then we've got Dr. Sarah Trin, uh, Dr. McAdams colleague and fellow at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, neonatal perinatal medicine fellow. And then we have Dr. Nick Slayman, of course, joining us, pediatric intensivist at Newmore's DuPont Children's Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. The four of these folks, along with us as your hosts, are going to have a great conversation next Friday, noon central, April 19th. So stay tuned. And that link I just posted is where all the previous recordings of the past episodes of The Pulse can be found. Well, that's all I have for housekeeping. But I wanted to, uh, unless there's anything specific we want to talk about, I was going to mention, I was trying to figure out this morning when I was thinking about this event coming up, like why why is it that pediatrics was so early and so intense getting into virtual simulation? And I was always kind of curious about that from the beginning. You know, it's like even at IMSH when we launched in 2019, you know, Nick Slayman with within a few hours of the trade show being open was like right at the booth and saying like, I need this right now. It within a few weeks was building content and, you know, so, and then obviously it was a, I think a month later, Dr. McAdams reached out and said, Hey, we're doing neonatal stuff at UW. Can we work with you? You know, Jeffrey at Boston children's hospital, you know, we've got, there seems to be a lot of interest in pediatrics and I, I'm trying to figure out why I think I have some ideas, but wanted to talk about that with you guys. I'm curious what you think. Yeah. Well, I can I can come at it from an EMS perspective, and and I think it's similar because all healthcare is relatively similar. We're all you know striving for that same goal, um, and you know from the EMS perspective, um, there's a there's a very high stakes, right? Because you have a very young person, so there's very high stakes, and and for us at least, it's uh, it's low incidence, so we don't see as many children. Um, and then, you know, obviously having that high, that high stakes, um, for my, for my students, it was, it had so much to do with the fact that my students couldn't get in to see some of those compl complicated, uh, pediatric cases. They don't happen that often. And so when they do happen, those are the ones that we really want them to see because we really want them to get a good understanding of what's going on in these complicated cases. So looking at it from an EMS perspective, um, I think I think for us in terms of pediatrics is, you know, you're talking about very high stakes and therefore very high pressure for the provider um, and, and, and low, um, uh, low frequency of, of those type of, of uh, incidents and calls. That makes a lot of sense. So high, high stakes, there's a lot of pressure, you know, mm -hmm. you're dealing with um, a situation that you probably don't see every day, like you just said, and there's, there's, you know, you want to make sure you get it right, you know, and I think, so maybe part of the contributing factor is that intensity and in simulation can help desensitize you to that pressure. So I know that's something that all of the pediatric applications that we've been working on with a catechist, I think that's the the main reason that I hear 
is that we want people to be able to stay calm when there's really a high stakes scenario happening in real life. You want to be able to to manage your your stress levels. And I think that's where, you know, I know Dr. McAdams and Dr. Sleeman, you know, have both been interested in, you know, just biometric, you know, data to be able to measure like just how um, stressed out are you? How, how How's your blood pressure doing? How's your blood flow? You know, how's your heart rate doing? And can you stay calm uh, in that situation? And the more you're seeing that and experiencing that, the less likely it is that you're going to have, um, you know, a nervous reaction in the event of a real life emergency. I had a really great pediatric rotation when I was in paramedic school. Um, our pediatric rotation was we, we spent a week with, um, with a pediatrician. So we went to this pediatrician's office. He knew us uh, as students. He knew our college. Uh, he was very involved in our learning. Um, so much so that he was actually the first person that told me about like Roth IRAs. I remember that from him. He was, he was like, listen, young man, we need to talk. And, and, and so, and he was a great doctor, absolutely great doctor. And it really helped me hone my skills in terms of doing pediatric assessment, because with adult assessment, I can ask a lot of open-ended questions and and get some relatively good feedback. I mean, some people will laugh when I say that because some of the feedback we get is not very good at all, but, but I can get some relatively good feedback. You know, uh, my, my, my wife falls and she hurts her knee. I can ask her, okay, where does it hurt when you bend it? You know, like, is it, I can, I can get some of those answers when my kids were littler. Now that they're older, I can probably get those answers. But when my kids were littler, it was a little harder to get that answer because a lot of times it was, it hurts everywhere, you know, or something like that. So it was a little harder to get that. Um, and, and I think that, 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 you know, simulation overall and then VR simulation helps to solve that, that, that question, you know, and, and that, and, and, and give us that chance to, to get more uh, hands-on with pediatrics as well. Yeah. And, and you know, I, come across this concept in, in some of my readings about the understanding behind, you know, the, the uh, effectiveness of, of VR for training and education is this concept they call DICE, right? Anything that's dangerous, impossible, counterproductive or expensive, right? That's just not realistic or very high risk in the real world is an ideal scenario for somebody to be practicing in, in VR, right? Why? EMS first responders, great stuff, right? Um, we get demands and and requests all the time for our uh, MCI, our, our multi-casualty incident uh, scene and scenario, because these things are not, and, and I think all of us may have participated one time or another where they brought actors in, you know, to play in these elaborate, you know, day-long exercises you know, and it takes forever to coordinate and hard to schedule, a lot of man hours, very expensive. And, you know, instead of being able to put on a headset and kind of click a button and you're in that scene and scenario, you know, immediately whenever you want on demand. I think it's very similar with the pediatrics element, right? I mean, those are not things that you can generate for practice at any given point. Right. And, and when we can do it, virtually without risk to anyone and still have kind of that ideal outcome of having walked a practitioner through a event or a series of events, then, you know, everybody's a winner. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's stressful on the training officer too. So like when I was a field training officer and I was taking students um, on my ambulance, you know, the stakes are higher for me too, for pediatrics, you know, and, and going to a pediatric call, many times we're already very nervous, even as a seasoned provider. Um, you know, I, I give an example of a, a call I had once where um, we got a call for a drowning and, and I heard seven-year-old and I thought, uh-oh, okay. So I start going through all of the stuff in my mind. What do I need to know? What do I need to know? What do I need to do? And, and my mind is just racing. And then when we heard them at, at, in dispatch talk about it again, they said 70 year old. And my mind immediately calmed down. Not that this is going to be any less impactful. It's still going to be, it's still a life. So we're still working on saving a life. 
But it, there is a big difference for us as providers when it comes to a seven-year-old versus a 70-year-old, okay, in our minds and the way we feel and the way yep. that we react to that. Because I've, I've, I run multiple calls on 70-year-olds. I haven't run as many calls on seven-year-olds. And so now if I have a trainee out with me, if I have a brand new uh, paramedic or if I have a paramedic in training that's now out with me, my my the chances of me handing that patient over to that trainee are a lot lower because the stakes are so much higher. And so I'm going to look at it more as like, I don't, okay, I'm, I, you know, I'll be there, I'll be watching and, you know, especially if we get there and it's like, the kid's out of the pool and everything's fine or something like that. But, but even if it's not, it's still very high stakes in our minds. And, and it, and it makes me very nervous to then hand that over to a brand new paramedic or to a paramedic student. And, um, and, and that, you know, that was true when I was a paramedic student as well. I remember my preceptors being, uh, yeah, I'm going to take this one, you know? Um, and so, it was, and that was understandable, but now what we can do with, with virtual reality is I can put you in that situation and, and, and I don't have to worry as much, you know, and that's what simulation is all about. But the key to this is that I want to see how you do not. I want the, the, you know, I want feedback from the, the, uh, the algorithm. No, no. I want to see how you act and how you do. And then that way I can make some corrections on that as well. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you know, one of the other factors, perhaps that fa that that um, that that has led to the the increased interest in VR simulation and pediatrics is just that historically, from what I understand, um, pediatrics have been underserved in simulation, and even in terms of mannequin availability and the characteristics of the mannequin, the diversity of the mannequins, you know, it's very difficult to authentically represent. Um, true pediatric patient populations across because it's just there's so much change that's happening in the development of a child, whereas adults are kind of adults, you know, and there's obviously differences that change over time. But pediatrics, it's like there's a big difference between a three year old and a seven year old and a nine year old and a 12 year old. They're very, very different. So there's a lot more need there to represent a broader range of different age groups. And, you know, um, so historically un underserved, we hear that quite a bit or that. Perhaps the, um, you know, one one thing we hear from a lot of, you know, a lot of the pediatric intensivists we work with is just the realism is also not there, where it's like when you're dealing with a real world pediatric situation, it's very different than if it's a plastic doll. And there's always going to be certain things that you have to do hands on with mannequins. We're not not dissing mannequins at all. You have to continue using that. We're not trying to replace that. They're really, really important and they've been important for decades. But you know, I think it, there is definitely a lack of intensity and a lack of seriousness that I've heard from you, Bill, you know, that there's just, they don't take it seriously. They kind of think, okay, you know, um, so underserved and maybe not as realistic. Yeah. Cause many times, you know, we, we'll, we'll set up the, uh, we'll set up the, the simulation rooms and there'll be a bassinet in there and then there'll be a baby laying in the bassinet. Right. And, um, and, and they'll, they'll go in and it, it's, it's a, it's a doll, right. You, you as a kid you had stuffed animals or you had a doll or you, you know whatever and and so it, it kind of makes a connection back to that sometimes where it's like eh. and i've always kind of been like let's get them out of here let's go to somewhere else in the in the college or or you know either on campus or off campus or whatever i used to do stuff you know, even in neighborhoods around around the the college that I worked at down in Florida, we could do that because the weather was always cooperative or almost always cooperative. Um, and so, yeah, it 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 does make it a little harder to keep that realism because it's still a doll, it's still a mannequin, um, and 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 that's the one that you know earlier they were kind of playing around with and everybody was holding and going here, it's your baby now and it's your baby now and. And now we've put it into this bassinet and now you need to be realistic with it. Um, and, and I agree, you know, mannequin simulation is still mannequin simulation. That doesn't really change. Um, and, and that helps a lot with that tactile feel, those kind of things. But learning how to really care for a pediatric patient is the, I think the other thing it brings in <clears throat> is the ability to bring in a more realistic parent as well. You know, where you're having a parent now standing there 
and they're asking questions and all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and so what I always said with pediatric calls is that a lot of the pediatric calls, the, 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 the patient is not necessarily the child. It's more the adult. Um, you know, he, he, kid comes, falls off of his bike, something like that. And there's some bleeding, you know, it's a head, a head wound, which bleed, they bleed a lot, you know, and you have a, a very frantic parent, completely understandable. I, I think even as a 27 year paramedic, I probably would be too. Um, but, and to, to address the, 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 um, the, the, the sort of development cycle, when we're talking about that with pediatrics, is think about just the first year for people who are parents. In the first year, we actually, we always go by months, right? My child's one month old or two months old or three months old. And even early on, you go by weeks, you know, 24 weeks, whatever it may be. Um, that's because of what, that amount of development that goes on in that first year, even in the first two years too. So, you know, that, that, that also changes then the way the parent is going to act as well. So we can do that as well too within within the, the VR world. I think even a little easier. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. Because a yep. lot of times what we'd have is the instructor that would come out and act as the parent or a different yeah. instructor. They know that instructor and that's the parent, you know, like so now you get that barrier between um between me as the instructor and then the student where you have a parent that looks different from me. Yep. Yep. I know that was certainly that's the one of the main things I think that's coming up next in the 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 agenda for UW is is family members. You know, it's always been from the beginning something they've been talking about that it's very difficult to teach that. And you know, one thing I've heard a lot from Dr. McAdams in particular is, you know, you get a new resident that you're training and, you know, you go through a couple of resuscitations, you know, and then it's like, okay, now you've seen me talk to the family member once, now you do it, you know, and it's like, well, that's a, there's a craft to communicating effectively, and you want to be able to practice that, and be ready for doing it in a, in a sensitive and effective way in the real world. And it's very difficult to do that with mannequins. It's very difficult to do that any other way. But in the virtual environment, you could really have a dialogue with multiple family members. You know, they're they're all there, you know, and that's more, you know, a more accurate um, connection to what you're probably going to be facing in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. So one other thought I had was... Um, you know, I wonder if perhaps it isn't something having to do with how we how we created a catechist in the first place was really, you know, it's kind of, you know, I don't know if there's a better analogy, but we're sort of a chameleon in a way where we sort of blend in. We kind of don't try to make it about a catechist. We try to make it, we try to kind of get into the background and put our customers in the forefront generally, and even in terms of our marketing and and everything else. It's not about us. It's about what our customers are doing. But I think also, instead of like, I think a lot of other software is developed by somebody who is an expert, who is a, a neonatal intensivist or a, a physician or trauma physician that gets an idea that they want to build virtual reality. And then they go about the process of learning how to build virtual reality, which is a daunting, difficult task and, you know, getting there. But we came at it from a background of being our, our SME, our expertise is in building virtual reality. We have a team and we have expert developers that are very, very, you know, advanced in terms of their knowledge and capabilities of development. And so we focused on building tools and we didn't really get in. We, we wanted our customers to be able to do whatever they want with it. And so I think what, what you're doing then in that case as a chameleon platform that a catechist is, it's like we launched it and we are like, and, you know, and a lot of people are confused. They're like, well, tell me, you know, what curriculum do you provide? And it's like, well, we don't, we're not com curriculum developers. Well, what scenarios does it come with? Well, we have some scenarios, but it's really what kind of scenarios do you want to run? You know, and they're, they're always looking to us to do the teaching. You know, it's like, well, you're the teachers, you guys do the teaching, you know? And, um, but I think what happened when we launched it is we heard from all these pediatric you know, users that because we had that flexibility, they saw it and said, okay, because your platform can be changed into whatever we want, I want to do pediatric simulation with it. Whereas some of the other platforms where we are only a nursing platform, we are only a physician training platform, we only do skills based for medical students, or, you know, they all have very, very unique specialties, whereas we're sort of like, we're waiting to see what you tell us. What do you want to do? So the pediatric, you know, people come and say, let's turn this into a pediatric platform for our application, which is great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think of it more like, more like, you know, 
the stage and the and the theater right and that's that's more what a catechist is like is more like a a stage in a theater and then what you're doing is you're bringing in the highly skilled actors you're bringing in the people that go okay um we need to, and 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 out of, in in a catechist is the, the the set built set builders as well but what you're bringing in is those actors and those those professionals who now say okay we need this over here we need this over here we need this over here this needs to be here in order to do what we want to do and i get that one a lot too um and it's it it's a source of a little bit of confusion early on and they kind of early on i'll get faculty to go oh so I thought like my student was going to go with you and then they were going to do this thing or, you know, like you were going to give them a headset. They were going to do this thing. And then later on, I was going to get a, a report that said they, they, they did this and they did it right. And I'm like, I, I wouldn't want that. I maybe, maybe there are people that want, I would not want that personally. I didn't want that. And that was what attracted me to a catechist early on is, I was teaching cardiology and I said, you know, I want to be able to bring a heart in. I want to be able to teach using this as a tool. And then when we started thinking more about what could we do in terms of scenarios, I said, well, I, I've got this scenario over here. And literally I gave it to you, John. And I said, this is like what we use for dynamic cardiology. W what do you think? And what came out of it actually was like five different scenarios because we could just go, oh, well, you know, today that he's going to be an SVT. Tomorrow he's going to start off bradycardia. So it's more of the stage and the theater and the and the set builders. And then the professional actor comes in and says, this needs to happen. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. You know, or the producer. I get to be the producer. So, yeah, I, I love that, Bill. And I actually start a lot of my trainings. First training I have with new new customers I use that analogy and I said, look, your the plot of your story is your or your learning objectives, right? That's the story you're trying to tell. And then you set the stage. What's the environment? Where is this taking place? Is it a, a hospital room? Is it a patient's apartment? Is it a city street? Is it a, you know, I, ICU? Is it an ER? You know, and then who are your actors? And those are the characters you bring in. And then what are your props, right? And those become the assets. Do you need an IV pole? Do you need a wheelchair? Do you need you know, uh, oxygen tank, you know, again, it goes back to those learning objectives. That's where it all starts, right? That's the plot. And then you're just, you're putting the stage together. And then, like you say, then you bring on the actors and you, you know, you, uh, you uh, role play out the, the message you're trying to get across. Um, everybody plays the role. I mean, and I think we've even used that in healthcare, I know in ACLS, Right. It's mm -hmm. kind of who's the act, who are the actors, who's playing what part. Right. Because you you typically have the physician and you have the nurse and the respiratory therapist and you have somebody doing the meds and you have your person, uh, your scribe. Right. And everybody's playing a part in that. So it, it lines up really, really nicely. Yeah, you know, it, it also lines up with VR game development, in my experience. It seems like early on, you know, we had a lot of VR games that were attempting to replicate existing VR, you know, existing video game sort of modalities. You know, you had the third person, first person shooter kind of experience, and you had, you know, a lot of sort of NPC automation. And it was something that a lot of them were standalone experiences. You would go in and you would try to level up through the game. And, you know, one thing I think I, I have a lot of respect for Kent Bai. He's the uh, the founder of uh, Voices of VR. He does a great job. Yeah. If you haven't already listened to Voices of VR podcast with Kent Bai, he is a genius and he has done a tremendous job documenting the historical. You can go back 10 years now, I think, and listen to podcasts with, you know, Palmer Lucky when he was still working on that first Kickstarter campaign. You know, yeah, Kent was yeah. right there with his microphone, you know. So, and it's been all along the, the, the years he's had a great archive, but he has consistently... Um, talked about the importance of narrative and how that's the missing ingredient in a lot of the early VR games was this sort of misunderstanding that it had to be this like advancing through a linear kind of experience versus, 
you know, his observation was like, no, you're in a place and you just want to look around at the detail. Like you could look at the, you know, in like Half-Life Alex, you could spend a half an hour just looking at the watch you're wearing and the the detail is, the, you know, and then you're looking around at the environment and you're like, oh, I can open these drawers and I can take this white mark and you know, I can draw on the glass with it, you're like all these little details and you haven't moved an inch. You're still in the same place, but the environment and everything in it is telling you a story. And that narrative is what's important to be able to create because, you know, there's like studies that I don't know exactly how this goes, but if you begin with a statement by saying once upon a time, people's brains change immediately when you say those words and they start leaning in and they want to know how does it go next and why wouldn't that happen with students, right? Students become engaged when you put them in a headset and you're like, this pair, the, these people just came back from yoga and they were making coffee and then there was this and the phone isn't ringing and the dog is barking and there's a story and you get walked into that and then you're really immersed in it. Um, and I think that's where we can go next with VR in the medical and healthcare simulation. A, a lot of what we're doing and a lot of what our customers are, are doing is already kind of going in that direction. But um, I've always believed, you know, we've got these patients like there's, we should start building a, a contiguous narrative of all these people in a catechist, like, who are they? Where do they live? What do they do? Like, we already kind of have that where we know like Ryan, the pediatric patient that Dr. Slayman was working with is the grandson of, uh, um, uh, what's our main guy? The guy Miles in our Johnson. heart. Miles, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah Miles' yeah. grandson, you know, and Miles' right. wife is Karen. And like, so we're starting to kind of like get this narrative and it's like a whole yeah. city that's like always happening. And sometimes there's a disaster and we have to go in and we have to save some lives in our little <laughs> in our little world there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I like it. And, and what I did with, so I just took originally, I just took when we started, when we started building out more for, for, you know, like, we 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 wanted more respiratory, so we wanted we wanted congestive heart failure, we wanted asthma, we wanted you know all COPD, the normal stuff that we would see um, as as EMTs, paramedics. You know, we we'd see them when we go to clinicals in the ER. We'd see them out in the field. You know, those they're very common, um, uh, very common uh, scenarios, and we wanted the students to get those wins too, right? Um, and, and we would just, we, that, that's what I did. I just started writing scenarios and I was like, okay. I, I mean, I was sitting on my couch with my phone going, all right. So, uh, there's a 48 year old male sitting on his couch, uh, watching TV and all of a sudden he becomes short of breath. Right. And so we, I, I just kind of went from there and then I just told the story. And it's what I do in my instruction too. I tell a lot of people, I don't use PowerPoint when I, when I teach and they're like, what do you do? And I tell stories. I tell stories and we have discussions and we discuss, a, we do a lot of case study stuff where we're talking about, hey, when I was out in the field, I had this patient and this is what happened. And my students love it because they're like, and, and what did it turn out to be? What was it? You know, those kind of things. It's the same reason that right now, and this is, you know, this is an older series, but I'm watching The Resident. Okay, it's on Netflix right now. I'm watching The Resident, and most of the time, I hate medical shows. I I hate them, but I'm watching yeah. this the, the Resident, and and it and it comes up with these little things, and I'm like, oh, that's Tetralogy of Fallot, and then they're like, uh, Tetralogy of Fallot, and I'm like, aha, see, and it's because they're telling a story, and I'm yeah. sitting there watching the story and going, well, that's pretty interesting, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what we like about series, that's what we like about movies, that's what we like about all of those things. And that's just what we're doing, you know, when we when we do uh, simulation, when we do VR simulation, it's 360 and more immersive. Yep, immersive storytelling. And, and your participants get to play a, a, their own role in the story instead of just listening. They get to that's be active right. participants. That, and that is a distinction, I think, and that uh, going back to Kent, I think that's what he recognized early on was that it, you're no longer like playing the role of just a character in the game where you're like, well, that, you know, I'm playing that character. Instead, it's like if you ask when you're in VR and you're wearing a headset, like, who are you right now? Well, you're I'm me, you know, like you are you, <laughs> you're, you're not playing a role of someone else. You are you like you, you are responsible. Right? Yeah, you have agency like you are the person you're the main character right now. You get to be, you know. Um, I think that's a really important distinction between that and traditional video games is like, you're the, you're the one you're the, and, and that changes the whole idea of the narrative is like, now you're in it. You are part of the story. 
like in the way that Disney does when you go to, I always mention Disney World and Disneyland, anything Disney in terms of the experience of going to one of their parks, they're very good at that. They know that you are there for an experience and they're all about the narration, the storytelling and the walking you into the experience. And one of the things that I'm hoping we can gradually continue working toward is that idea that even before you put on the headset, I think we can start dropping you know, a little, a trail of breadcrumbs about what you're about to experience. And one of my good friends, Anton Hand, he's the developers of Hot Dogs, Horseshoes, and Hand Grenades, which is oh, a great yeah. VR game if you hadn't played it already. I've <laughs> known Anton for years. Anton actually built the 3D model for the Sacramento Kings Arena and a bunch of other projects that Anton and I worked on together. But one time when I was in uh, Los Angeles, I think it was the Vision Summit, uh, Unity's Vision Summit, you know, Anton had created this amazing g game. It was like a space shooter type game. And you know, before when I walked up to him, and I've known Anton for years, so he are, we already knew each other, but he's like, hey, listen, let me tell you about this experience. And he explained what was about to happen. And then he asked me to sit down and there was this whole ceremony to it. You know, knowing Anton, like all the craft of this is very important to him. And then he puts the headset on. And before he begins the experience, he, he says in my ear, like, have fun. And I thought, what a simple thing, but he programmed my brain. It's like he hacked into my mind. And then the minute the experience started, I thought, have fun. You know, it's like you, you're you telling the story and you're bringing, you're walking people into that experience the way that Disney World does, you know. And so that by the time you're facing the learning objectives and you're dealing with the patient, you're already like there. You feel like you are that person. And that's a difficult, that you you really, it's sticky. You really start to identify with that, you know, being in that space. Well, and I think yeah. we're starting to, to to kind of get on the edges of of this whole idea of the the theory behind the psychology of learning in VR, right? Which is, you know, when you go to class or you take a college class, a lot of times it's very abstract, and you might be able to rote memorize, you know, certain things and drugs at you know this level and that level and that you know is for that thing, but when you can put it all in a context in a story right it it somehow embeds in our mind easier right and in the file system we have to go through when we have to remember something you know when when there's this image i can pull up that i was in this room with with millie right and this thing was happening and i had to figure out what to do i can somehow kind of remember that better than if i read it in a book somehow about you know, Millie had congestive heart failure and was treated this way. And this is what you saw, you know, but when I was actually there and saw it and there was context to it with that patient, right, that memory just somehow gets embedded better. And that that learning occurs at, at a much more rapid pace, I think. Yeah, you're putting it in the context of life, Um you know, and, and you're putting it into a context that people can understand too. Like I've always said, I'm, I'm bad at math and it's, it's true. I mean, my, my, my whole family, my, my uncle was absolutely brilliant or is absolutely brilliant. Um, but, uh, math just wasn't his thing, right? It just, he, he became an archeologist and an anthropologist because math was not his thing. So, uh, and, and it trickled down. I'm the same. Like I can do medical math because I understand medical math. And I understand the things that I'm trying to accomplish and I'm putting it in a context and I could, I can get that. I business math. I understood no problem there because I could understand, you know, uh, supply demand, how all these things work together. I totally got that. But when it came to more abstract theories, like, you know, algebra and, and those kind of things, I struggled horribly with it until I had a teacher that finally put it into something I understood. And it was like, oh now i get why the distributed property works the way it does and like oh okay okay and then you know later on that semester she was helping with helping me with trigonometry and i was like oh yeah okay i get it Trig trigonometry yeah it makes sense you know so i needed that con contextualization i i think of the movie big and and this is going back. I'm really dating myself on this one. Sorry, guys. Um, but the movie Big, right? The, the 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 main character, Tom Hanks, he's sitting at dinner, and this kid comes up and is asking his dad for help with algebra. And and Tom Hanks is, you know, he's actually a kid, you know, he's the one that becomes big. And so he goes in to help this kid with algebra. And so he goes, 
Okay. So Larry Bird is going to, in the, in the first quarter, he scores 10 points. So how many points is he going to score the whole game? And the kid's like, that's easy, 40 points. And he's like, well, that's algebra. And he goes, wait, it is? And all he did was put it into context. And that's what we're doing with, with medical simulation or, or any simulation. It happened today with HVAC with Brian Moore. Same thing. You're just putting into that context that someone understands. I mean, Brian went into the HVAC simulator and immediately starts picking things up and doing the thing. And and me, I'd go in there and go, I don't even know what, what am I supposed to do here? But Brian's there. He's doing his thing because it's within a context that he's already fully aware of. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And that's what helps us remember, too, is we're bringing that now back to a context uh, that we understand. Absolutely. You know, along similar lines, I've thought a lot about the concept of uh, the memory palace, which I'm sure you're both familiar with, where if you're trying to remember something, if you associate it with a place as you kind of build a palace in your mind of the different things you're trying to remember, you know, could we do something like that within a virtual environment? You know, and I've tried to talk the the folks at UW into teaching uh, their their physicians, you know, t training on neonatal intensive training on like on our a Mars environment. You know, like what happens if you throw a curveball at them and you're in a totally different environment? You're on Mars, but you're still doing a neonatal. It's everything else. All else is equal. Would that memory hook set deeper? If you're like in a completely for like a completely different environment where it's like you'd never do that, um, you know, I think they they pushed back a little bit and said, well, that'll be great if we're ever delivering babies on Mars, you know. <laughs> 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 but like, you know, the concept is there, you know, it, could, it just feels like, you know, if you could do these things in environments that make your brain just go, what? Like, it just feels like it opens up an opportunity for your brain to receive new information and put it into that context. But Maybe if you don't ever reinvigorate that context, that associated memory doesn't come back. I don't. I don't know. Well, now I got to try a mass casualty on Mars, John. You just gave me a. Great you know, idea. we got to so, be ready. You know. There's a lot of effort going into getting to Mars. Eventually, we're going to need training. I mean, you know, it, it could happen. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I know my. So I've been out at EMS teaching for a while, but. Um, I know my EMS students would have would have loved it and would have adopted it because they always knew I was going to do weird stuff like that to try to make sure that things would stick. And so I, I'll do it like mass casualty on Mars or delivering a baby on Mars or yeah, why not? Yep. And I know that there's a, you know, there's been a lot of effort with smells, you know, bringing smell in. Well, we know that smell in your brain, like is very, very closely associated with memory. And so I wonder at some point in the future, if there couldn't be just little micro nuanced, you know, yes. smells that we're actually encountering as we're trying to learn so that the brain is like, oh yeah, I, I got to remember this. And it's just filing it into places it might not otherwise go because it's, you're, the smell is kind of bringing your you to places, you know, and I'm way out of my lane coming and uh, commenting on neurology, neurology oh, or learning, you know, it's just, uh, but it's fun to think about. Yeah, it is. I, I've always wanted the, the gloves with the tactile feedback, yeah. right? You know, yeah. instead of controllers, you know, I want to have gloves where, you know, it's fully aware of your finger placement and you, you get yeah. the feedback when you touch something and yeah. Uh, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that really gets exciting. For sure. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, and muscle yeah. memory is real. You know, there is a, such a thing as muscle memory and they're literally, I don't know if they're neurons, but they're neurological, like the, there is, they throughout your body, you know, I think there's a very close association with brain activity. And so once you put on that headset, I know this is something that John Walsh, a good friend of mine from Cochise College from way back, he was an early adopter of a catechist. He mentioned a lot and wanted to do studies on embodied cognition in terms of once you're in that headset, you're not just learning with your mind and your eyes, you're actually like grabbing onto things and moving around. And because you have agency and because your body is moving, you're just more likely to remember it just by virtue of your body being present in the space so that's a very you know building on that i think it really takes it to the next level when you're trying to introduce new concepts yeah it it happened with me um very early on john when we were when we were putting together the uh, dynamic cardiology scene it happened with me very very early on and i even commented about it back then that when i went into that scene and and I and we you know went to start doing a, a scenario right so we I was doing scenario and and I went into that scene I immediately came over and I went to Miles's head and to the top of Miles's head you remember that I remember I yeah to top of Miles's head and I knelt down right there and I grabbed the ambu bag and I started bagging Miles 
And I didn't even realize I had done it. I said to you, I was like, John, I just did exactly what I always do on a code because I always go to the, the airway. That's where I'm going to be. Uh, you know, if, if I'm coming into a code with a paramedic partner or with an EMT partner, they generally know I'm going to go straight to the airway. And so that was what I did. That, and and that, that was that, that was that just cognition. That was that memory um, that that's where I go. That's what I do. Um, you know, and I've even, I, I, even when we were in the, when the, in the OR scene, getting ready to intubate, you know, when I picked up the laryngoscope, I immediately transferred it over to my left hand and started to hold it while we were talking. And I'm like, look, I'm doing it. Look, <laughs> like this thing is in my left. Hand. It's never going to be in my right hand. Cause it's, it, you know, it's a left-handed tool. It's always going to be in my left hand. So that, I mean, just that cognition is always there. Yeah. For sure. Yep. Yep. I think we're just scratching the surface of where that's going to lead. I think as we understand more and more about it, you know, a lot of people think it's just about like you're effectively blindfolding the student so they can't look at their phone and that's why they're learning better. And that's a big part of it too. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate consequence of the world that we live in today, but Hey, it's true once they're in, they don't even want to look at their phone anyway, because they're, they're so engaged in the experience, but there's all kinds of things about like wearing that device and having to interact with your hands in that world that really does uh, take it to the next level. One of the things I think about, you know, we've got 20 minutes left just to think a little bit about the future of this. Where is this going in the future? And I'm really curious next week. I hope we have time to talk to the panel about what they think about it, because I know these are visionary people that spend most of their time thinking about what's coming next, more so than what's even right in front of them now. I think they've all got big ideas and ambitious plans for the future. But one of the things for me, and I'm curious to know what 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 either of you, th both of you think about this, but you know, it seems to me that the, what all at the end of the day, we're trying to simulate real world things that are happening in the real world, right? And we all have hospitals and clinics in our communities, and we've all been in those places, and we know what's going on in there. And it's not always pretty, right? Like there's very traumatic things that happen. There's wonderful things that happen. People's lives are being saved and they're being, you know, there's this world that happens inside of these clinical sites. That's what we're trying to simulate. We're not trying to simulate simulation in a virtual world, you know, like we're trying to simulate what's going on in real life. So right now it's like if this is the real world and then we're sort of bringing it through this process, virtual reality, computer game engines, all the different technologies that we're using to get there. And now we're in this virtual thing. What I want to do is take these two and bring them as close together as we possibly can so that you're simulating what's actually happening in those clinical environments. And right now, I think the gap is too big. I think there's not enough of an association. So at some point, what I would love to do is start getting closer and closer. And we've seen this happen in some of the hospitals. Um, and I'm hoping some of the, the folks can talk a little bit about this. But you know, where they know a patient is coming in that has a particular condition and they can go into a catechist and they can pull up the editor and they can say, okay, this patient is coming in, you know, tonight at 10 o'clock, we know they're coming and they have some kind of a condition that's a little bit maybe counterintuitive um, or uh, difficult, or they want to make sure everybody's up to speed so they can model that exact patient and be prepared so that when they show up in the ICU, that they're going to be ready because they've re they've gone through it and they should have deja vu. If anything happens, they've already gone through it. That's what I want to see all over the place in every hospital and every every clinical environment. For for me, that's the future of this. But I'm curious, what what do you guys think? Where's this all going? I I agree. I I I'll actually try to tack away from EMS for a second here. Because I see it in terms of surgery, you know, if you're if you have a very complicated surgery, which I haven't done any surgeries, I've gotten to witness some when I was doing my my OR rotation as a paramedic student. Um, but if you have a very complicated surgery, a neurosurgery, a, you have a you know something that's really complicated. Maybe you haven't you haven't done it before. You haven't done it a lot. Um, I, I could see virtual reality being a great way to simulate that, and even to simulate it over and over again. And even to like take that patient CT scan, bring that patient CT scan now into VR. It's created out in VR exactly what it's going to look like inside of their their chest or something, right? You're doing a, a heart surgery, and so so now you can go in and you can see what you're going to see before you ever cut a patient open. Um, one of the one of the great lines from the the show The Resident is, you know, we create wounds in order to heal people. That's what surgeons do. They cut into people and they create wounds in order to heal people. And, and 
So before you go and cut into that person, now you have that chance to, to simulate that well beforehand, um, you know, potentially. I mean, obviously we're talking, sometimes we could be talking about emergency surgeries that are happening right now, but we could be ta talking about something that we have a little time to prepare for. And if you do, having that, you know, being able to import a CT into virtual reality and then, you know, take that CT and be able to then actually, you know, operate on that person before you get to that person. I think that would be, that would be uh, amazing. That would be incredible. You know, absolute game changer. Yep. You know, I know I hear a lot of things from, you know, I train all of our new, new customers and that without a doubt, you know, they start bringing up, can we do this? And can we do that? And, you know, those things that are really out there that are fascinating are kind of like what you're suggesting there, Bill, you know, this kind of idea of mixed reality, right? Where I can see my real world surroundings, but then uh, overlay or input a virtual item, a virtual patient within the room or a virtual device within a room, and then be able to, to meld those two things together, you know, that will eventually be really powerful. You know, I, I had joked before about the gloves, but this idea of being able to use hand tracking uh, instead of having these controllers that we necessarily have to have, right? That kind of natural action of, of gripping something or picking something up or touching something, that's a big thing. And then I think a lot of, of automating our um, responses and scenes, right? I get a lot of requests for, I want something to happen when the student does this without the instructor kind of triggering it to happen. Um, so these kind of triggers that that we can create in scenes. You know, there's so much that we can build, I think, behind the scenes that can, you know, kind of just build on top of this foundation we have and make this even better as we move move forward. And to your point, John, about it being like being there for real, you know, and, and having things occur that we might expect. You know, Bill, you like to tell that story about the atropine adenosine uh, yep. thing that happened, yep. right? But you had to kind of trigger that vital sign thing to occur. That's right. And it would be great, like, if, again, that was kind of built in somewhere in the background where, oh, okay, why did this occur? And then, you know, you're not taken away from the scene maybe to do interact with the, the software to occur. You make something yeah. happen. Like a physiology so, engine or something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, like, like for example, if if I have a list of medications and I go uh, atropine and then how many milligrams, six milligrams, then that would go, okay, this is what's going to happen if he gives atropine six mm -hmm. milligrams, you know, and and then and then it would actually do that. There's a lot of back end to that. Um, I I like oh, personally, I like, oh, to yeah. be able to, you know, I I'm the guy I like to be able to do, you know, I'm the tinkerer. I'm like, all right, ah, oh, no, that yeah. would move this much, and this yeah. would do this, and that would do that. Um, well, but, and I think if I can interrupt, I think we're getting there to a degree with the panels we yes. have, John, right, where they progress and a series of things will happen yeah. as something moves from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four. Um, so I think that's the first part of that, right? Um, but yeah, following we, those algorithms out, yeah. When we first started talking about those sequencers, God, it's mm -hmm. been, I was it two, it's been like three it's been years, a while, so. yeah. Um, anyway, when we first started talking about those sequencers, we, we were looking at it really in the dynamic cardiology, you know, big surprise, cardiology is my thing, but it really fit well with dynamic cardiology because there's an expectation you do this, you do this, you go to that, you go to that, you go to that. It really, really fit well. And then it was like, okay, well, we can do it for respiratory. We can do it for the, you know, mm -hmm. well, we have an opiate overdose. We can do that. We can do it for this. We can do it for that. And that definitely has made things easier for me as the operator to just go, all right, moving on to the next piece mm -hmm. while still at the same time being able to go, oh, no, no, you gave atropine, not adenosine. Whoop, there we go. We're going to change that, right? Yeah. So I can still do that. I love you that. You still piece. have that fine love control. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I, I absolutely love that piece. You know, it it it's going back to, to uh, hand controls for a second there. It, it, it happened to me yesterday when I was teaching our, well, I, I don't teach the Spanish class. The VR uh, program teaches it. 
um, and then the instructors there. But uh, so so I was I had a headset that was having problems, so I did a factory reset, and I'm going back in to to log into this program and to make sure that I can log in correctly. And using the handsets got annoying. I was like, click, click, yeah. click. So I just switched it over to hand tracking and let it track my hands. And then I could actually type on the, and mm -hmm. that's just the first step. Yeah. yeah. Cause my thought is we have better hand tracking. I can now go over and pick up the stethoscope and put it on the patient. I can mm -hmm. pick up the, and mm -hmm. put it on the patient and eventually have that haptic feedback where it may kind of feel like I have something there in my hand. So I think yeah. there's so much future to it. That's a, such yeah. a big question to ask there, John. And, and just, just, you know, the number of people that, that have difficulty when they're learning, grabbing something with one controller and moving themselves with the, I mean, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, can I rub my tummy and my head at the same time, right? It's like I sometimes spend a half an hour just trying to help people. Yeah. <laughs> grab, yeah. move, grab, move, you know, it's because it's foreign and, and it's, it, it's, you know, I take it for granted. You take it for granted because we've done it so long, but the first time you're doing it, you're like, uh, 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 what, uh, how do I move? I've got this thing in my hand. Yep. 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 And, it happens all the once time. Once you learn how to, how to do it. You kind of appreciate it. You kind of. Think, I wish you could do it in real in reality. Why can't, yeah. Why can't <laughs> I kind of teleport? teleport? <laughs> I just want to teleport, yeah. want to teleport yeah. upstairs. Yeah. yeah, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Another kind of just one last thought on the future is I think a lot about we're in a world of large language models right now, right with AI. And, you know, there's obviously the knee jerk sort of like thing we can do with AI is just make patients respond using a chat GPT plugin or whatever, like everybody else is doing. And maybe we do that. I just feel like it's such early days. Like I like to have a little bit of safety concerns in terms of how do we really keep this on a short leash if we're going to let students interact with it. And there's so much we don't understand about AI that we're taking a little bit more of a patient approach than I think a lot of other platforms are doing. But what I'm looking forward to is less about all those little things. There's, those are all going to happen. But if you look at the data that specifically the electronic medical record companies have, you know, I drive past Epic is right down the road from us here in uh, Madison, oh. you know, they're in Verona. So they're right in my backyard. And I, yeah. every time we drive past, I think about the, the amount of data that they have, you know, and I'm way out of my lane commenting on this. So if anybody from Epic ever hears this, I apologize, but I think a lot about the data and what, a, uh, what an LLM in that context could do in terms of, because you can't get that you shouldn't hypothetically be able to get the training data, right? So like right now there's patient protection and privacy that we have to worry about. But once that data is in the large language model, if we could be sure that it's anonymized and it's not gonna be directly accessible, could we then have access to a large language model that's essentially a derivative from all of the electronic medical records of all the patients all around the world that are being treated. And it's not just treating, you know, broad stroke things. It's down to like, I gave this much medication at this time of the day. It's every little nuance of healthcare is being tracked by those systems. So if we could introduce that and bring that into this virtual world where you're interacting with this artificial intelligence that's derived from real world data, I think you're going to get a lot closer to real world interactions where you might be surprised by things or you might get curveballs or you might get, you know, like all the subtle nuances again, where I want it to feel like when you put on that headset, the exact same way it feels like when you're in an actual medical environment. And I think that might be the final frontier there, but we're probably talking a few years out. I have a friend that works at Epic that talks about there's a, they do have a data set that is available, that is anonymous. And there's apparently a way that you can interact with it. It's on my list of things to talk about in the future, but <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Well, and I think another opportunity there, John, for us, especially with our focus on being able to customize scenes is in the building process, right? Yes. How yeah. great would it be, Bill, to just be able to go, um, I want a stethoscope in this scene and boop, yep. stethoscope drops in, yep. right? Wow. Now you're going yeah. saving loads of time yes yeah absolutely uh you know okay take the stethoscope and uh, uh i i you know or or just put your hand out stethoscope yeah and there it is and then you put the stethoscope yeah. where you want to yeah no i agree i agree i think there's so much potential 
there's so much. That question is a big question, and I love it. Yeah. Um, because if you had asked me that question, it's been like five years now. If you'd asked me that question five years ago, I would go, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I think there's a lot that can come out of this. And and really in the early days, I, I looked at I looked a lot at the limitations and I thought, oh well, it doesn't do this yet. And oh well, it doesn't do that yet. And, oh well, it doesn't do that yet. But more more often, uh, as time went on, I started to go, wow, this thing can do this. <laughs> or oh man, I can do that. And there's new things all the time where I'm like, wait, Gosh. I can do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was typing out an email this a couple of weeks ago now, and now it's starting to pop up and said, and let's go, would you like us to rewrite this for you? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. do I? Well, and, and I started to use it. And it's like, yeah. oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And, yep. and you just kind of now start getting used to it. You go ahead and write it, and then you go, okay, now rewrite it better for me. Why not? It's like when we went from we went from typewriters to to word processors and my word processor yeah. would, would correct the words as I was writing them. It would spell check it for me. So I could just write any, anything I wanted and it would spell right. check it, you know? Yep. I didn't, I, I, I didn't need to learn how to spell anymore, you know? <laughs> right. Or for me type, cause I'm a terrible typist. Right. Yeah. Well, and I do a lot of dictating. I do a lot of dictating yes. uh, of, of messages. Yeah. I, I, Powerful. I mean, I type still, but I do a lot of dictating of messages. I'll just click on mm -hmm. click on dictate and say, "Yeah, hey John, I agree. Let's yep. do that." You know, and it just Get that little microphone and yeah, yeah. Yep. Hey, Acaticus, build me a pediatric simulation. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, I guess we'll wrap it up. We're at the top of the hour. Yeah. Another Great. Acatica Simulation <laughs> Pulse live. Thanks, All thanks right. for watching, people from the future, and. So uh, I Something completely unrelated. I just have to mention it. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to go see a total eclipse, take it. Oh, it was yeah. One of the most amazing things I ever saw. Not related to a catechist at all. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe we need to build an eclipse simulator. I tell you, I want to see it over and over again, man. It was unbelievable. We went to Carmel, Indiana to see it. And oh, cool. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, and and John, maybe we will build it in in, uh, in a catechist. It was unbelievable. So yeah, that's cool. That's um, super so cool. So for us, us sciencey people, there's one for you right there. For <laughs> yeah, very cool. Or, or Bill, a total eclipse on Mars. How about that? Uh, on Mars. Let's do it. We can do it. Well, they got Phobos and Deimos. You could have two eclipses. It would be great. That would be amazing. <laughs> there, uh, there goes the there. There's there's the science brain. All right, there we go. <laughs> Bill ended it with talking about the eclipse. Oh, that. Had to. Talk about the future. Okay. <laughs> All right, awesome. guys. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Right. Have a great weekend. Yep. Yeah. Take care.